Welcome to the Ruddle Show Special Report. I'm Lizette, and this is my dad, Cliff Ruddle. Well, we haven't done one of these for a while. No. Well, we sometimes do them between seasons, and we're between seasons now, so it seems like a good time. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the John Engel International Endodontic Symposium took place recently, December 1 and 2 of last year, and per usual, it was hosted by USC. Now, the symposium consisted of submitted presentations, followed by live Q&As. And you were asked by Dr. Elon Rothstein to submit a 90-minute presentation. So did you choose the topic or did he choose the topic? He chose the topic. So how did that work? Oh, well, he when he invited me and we had a nice phone call, he just said, would you submit? Because uh, I sort of, we were talking about what he I would be comfortable talking about. I said, well, I could... Talk about non-surgical retrieval, I think it's really relevant. I could talk about microsurgery, and I really was excited about that. <laughs> and course. then he said, what else? And I said, well, I love 3D disinfection. So he said, let's do three. Not then. He wanted to think about it, get his other speakers. Then when he would look at the whole program that he was assembling, he came back two months later and said, 3D disinfection. So that was, uh, uh, you know, it's a hot button. So... We wanted to have information about lasers, gentle wave, smart light pro endo activator, uh, the most relevant technologies today. Okay, and so you you submitted the presentation, but then you participated in a in a live Q and A that followed the presentation. Right. So I did my ninety minute. Uh, so we hung up, and I over the months started working on my three D disinfection lecture, um, active irrigation, and then um, I submitted that and. Phyllis did, and they're all multimedia people. And then uh, he wanted to know if I could be available because some of the speakers were not all of them, but he wanted me to be available for a follow-up live session after my lecture of Q&A. Okay, well, we're only going to show you the actual presentation today, but then in season 11, which is upcoming, we actually are calling it the Road to 100 because it's going to end with show 100. So, on sometime during the next season, we will be doing a Q and A based on the questions that the symposium attendees asked. So, you have that to look forward to. So, should we watch the presentation now? Let's get started. Okay, let's see it. Warm greetings from Santa Barbara. I'm Cliff Ronald. I'm very pleased to be here today and have a a participation among this symposium. This is in honor of John Engel. It is the International Endodontic Symposium. And all around the world, people are watching uh, the different speakers as we honor John. Uh, I've known John for many, many years. Uh, I've been in several of his books and we've had many discussions around the world. And uh, I'll tell you a quick story about John Engel. So they were honoring him in Canada for his body of life's work as a pioneer, a leader, and an educator. And uh, we were getting some pictures of the camera people from the meeting wanted pictures, different graduate students wanted pictures. And so Phyllis and I were there with John Engel and John Engel kept looking very grim. So finally, I said to the camera person, I know how to make him laugh, let's do it again. So we went back, we got in our positions, I reached behind him and I pinched his ass. John broke into a big smile. We got the perfect picture. But how many of you can say you have pinched John Engel's ass? Okay, John, in great memory and respect. I want to honor Elon Rothstein. Professor Rothstein uh, coordinated this whole meeting and the show. He's done so much in Southern California and worldwide with his authoring of different books, chapters, a uh, tremendous number of publications, and he's a dear friend. So, Elon, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I want to thank you, the audience. You're all over the world, multiple countries, because of your love for endodontics. So, regardless of what's going on in the world and all the stresses, when we find our salvation, it's usually through our work. So, Elon, thanks for putting this together. Thank you all for attending. I know you're passionate about endodontics, and whether we see things a little different or not, we're always trying to learn. And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge the other speakers. We have many, many clinicians worldwide that are participating. And so it's a big honor to be part of those prestigious guys and gals that have done so much for the field over so many years. Let's get started. My topic is disinfection. 
It's a topic that has been very, very passionate for me from the time I graduated in the mid-70s in Boston at Harvard School of Dental Medicine. My mentor was Al Krakow. He was Herb Schilder's second student. Him and Levin were in the second class. First class was Cyril Gaughan. So we were baptized in Schilderian concepts. And of course, the speakage, the language in the 70s was root canal systems. So as a kid, I grew up talking systems. There were no such things as canals. There were just systems. So I've always advocated things that could help us treat the anatomy, the complete anatomy. And that means a proper access, a good access. It means a shape that is appropriate for the root that holds the canal, not too big, not too small, but allow us thinking ahead towards 3D disinfection and then filling root canal systems. So that's kind of what got me started. And I've been talking about this for years. I've been kind of amused, uh, sometimes a little bit uh, amused would be the word, sometimes actually surprised, sometimes like, really? All this push around the world in just the last decade. I want to fill a root canal. I got my first lateral canal. I got a furcal canal. I got an apical division. People are happy. So for that, I stand back as an old guy, and I'm really excited that people are coming along, but I kind of wonder what happened over the last 40 years, 50 years. I've been doing this over five decades. I've been kind of wondering what happened over four or five decades where nobody was really interested except apparently uh, stuff it. So let's look about how we might get this. We took teeth my multimedia team, Glenn Derbyshire and Mitch Goodgen, I want to acknowledge them. They've done a lot of work and helped me be a better teacher, but we took a lot of teeth, we scanned them, and then you're looking at a cleaned up 3D rendering that's very, very accurate pulpally, okay? So you can see bifidides, anastomosing, you can see the anatomy as it exists in human teeth. So let's take a little closer look at this. Uh, this is not a Ruddle thing or a Shilder thing. This goes back to about the early 1900s. And by finally 1925, Walter Hess published his book on root canal systems. Walter Hess talked about the root canals within the dentition of the human teeth. He had 10,000 sections. He gathered 10,000 teeth. And what he did is he decoronated the clinical crowns and then he used a mild acid and he digested out all the organic content from the root canal space. Okay, that's what he did. Then he used a screw gun and he used vulcanite rubber and he injected vulcanite rubber into these vacated spaces. Then he used uh, aqua regia, a mild acid, and he started dissolving away the cementum and the dentin and what he had left was a pure vulcanite rubber recovered specimen. This changed the profession, but not for the good. At that time in 1925, there was a lot of hopelessness because how could we possibly ever clean this system out and have success? But you can see like flags flying in the wind. You can see the anastomosing between the systems. You can see the complexity in that mesial root of a lower molar. And it's kind of humbling. Because you got to remember, we just got anesthesia. Oh, we got to get to a better color. We just got anesthesia. And that was 1884. And then we got the x-ray. Remember, that was Rankin. And that was 1895. And then we got anesthesia. Early 1900s, actually, there were two Austrians that... Uh, pharmaceutical guys that were in dentistry that made some cocaine and gave you an injection. That was in back in the 1800s. But if you go to Dakin, you think about Dakin, this solution came around in 1917 during the war. That was sodium hypochlorite. And then finally, you know, you get to Walter Hess, which you can see in 1925. And these were some pretty significant things because finally we could get them numb. Then we could take a crude film and see it a little, a little bit. And then we had some ear gain solution that would help us digest. And finally, Hess showed us the anatomy. So that was the setup. That was the setup. So clinically, if we move into the present, remember Godfrey, Sir Godfrey Hounsfield. Hounsfield was the guy that invented micro CT. So when micro CT came around 1971, it took a few more years, but then colleagues like Dr. Frank Paquet, my friend, did a lot of work at the University of Zurich 
and it was showing us the anatomy of the teeth. This was not invasive, no cutting, no decoronation, no dissolving away roots, just see the anatomy. If you look clinically, you can see the lesion of endodontic origin. You can see it. So we'll go to a little different color so we can see things a little bit better. But you can see the prescription on a napkin is to remove the silver point. The silver point is overextended and internally underfilled. And by removing it, do a little bit of shaping, not so much, mainly just reagents and active irrigation at that time and out with the lateral canals. Astute clinicians understand that the lesions form adjacent to the portals of exit. Okay, that's a good thing to understand. And then if you look at these things, and we can go out to about 25 years, you can see the inevitability of the bone to repair and regenerate around endodontically treated roots. Properly performed, endodontics is the cornerstone of restorative and reconstructive dentistry. And that's how we can do so much dentistry for our colleagues that is predictably successful. So if we keep going quickly now, this is just to show some anatomy and then we'll talk about some methods and then we'll talk about some ideas how to use those methods to get this kind of anatomy. So you look at the pre-op, it's a little three unit bridge on a physician you don't really see much of a canal. Maybe you see some evidence of something in here, little thickened PDL out in here, little thickened PDL, but a careful access. This is before microscopes, finding the catch, negotiating a multi-curvature planer all the way to the terminus, and then using warm gut aperture with a cone and packing down and hydraulically out with the anatomy. Okay, so this is fun stuff. I've been teaching it since the late 70s. I've taught tens of thousands of dentists worldwide to do this. And many dentists over decades have been sending me cases similar to this. So I know it's transferable what we're teaching. So you can see maybe why I got a little cynical when some of these $100,000 devices started emerging. Okay, I had a practice that was quite interesting to be in for decades. Uh, lots of prosthetics work, you know, they had full mouth reconstruction cases coming in. So when you're putting a, an abutment under a splint, you want everything to work. So here we are with the lingual branch. Notice we got that little recurvature, that little bend right at the end. Don't straighten it, don't transport it. Notice as we down pack deep into the buckle branch, out with the anatomy. Look at these things. These aren't lateral canals, really. They're like branches. So we can finish the backpack and we can go ahead and see how that looks. We can look down with a microscope. We can see the opening of that right in the lateral wall. And that's a cleaned up with xylol access so we can get a good photograph for you. And then go ahead and slide it over and backpack. And that's an abutment that's going to serve the patient very well under a roundhouse splint. So... The molar, it's the most researched tooth in the mouth, the most misunderstood tooth in the mouth, the biggest tooth by volume in the mouth. And of course, look at across this root. It is a broad root. It has a furcal side concavity and broad roots typically hold two canals. If you look carefully, you might see three portals of exit right there. You might see three. So let's look at the mesial root. Let's rotate it around. Can you count out loud? Can you still count? Uno, dos. You got four of them right in there. We got the one up here. Multiple portals of exit. I hope my Spanish friends and my Italian friends were moved by that effort to make a little connection through the language. But this case I did many years ago. Many of you have never even seen this work. I took about half my cases that some of you have seen and got rid of them so I could show you some new stuff today. That's a plexus. That's like a capillary bed. That is why we say systems. Which one's the important portal of exit? They're all important. Look at the Palo La Rue. Notice the, you know, drill path. You can see the drill path. We're trying to find that MB2 because we know from Stropko's work and many others that clinically we're going to find it over 90% of the time. But we don't always find a second orifice. But sometimes deep, you can see a plethora of curvature. You can see multiple portals of exit. You can see an outer loop, and off that loop, another lateral canal in the Paolo route. And this is fun endodontics. It's fun to do.
Coming back to Frank Paquet, he gave us many molars to look at that had been cleared. You can see between the MB1 and 2, there's an astomosin and the origination of another whole canal. You can see, if I move my mouse a little bit, you can see it right in here. And then, of course, Ruddle knew there was an MB1. I knew there was an MB2. But Ruddle did not know there was an anastomosine with another branch with its own apical portal of exit. Listen. We're talking about cleaning and disinfection, but start thinking a little bit about shaping and talk about hydraulics. Start thinking about packing, not talking about single cone stuff. All right, I'm talking about not a hydraulic sealer. I'm talking about a hydraulic mechanical technique where you can get Bernoulli's effect when you load that gutta percha with a plugger. Okay, so again, a second molar, not a first molar, one canal, two portals of exit, 90 degree curvature in the palatal, recurvature in the DB, but look at the furco canal. I've given many lectures and presentations over the decades to periodontal groups because they appreciate, maybe more than general dentists, the association and the interconnection between root canal systems and lesions. Lesions. So lower teeth, we'll look at a few of those and we'll be through with the first third. And the first third is to get you excited about anatomy. And these cases were done before we had all the technology. This was just called, uh, I, I don't like this word, but many people, legacy endodontics, you know, legacy endodontics. That's a way of saying it's old fashioned. It doesn't work. We have newer things. Well, do we or not we? Okay. Big lesions, divergence of roots, one tooth the culprit, do your pulp testing. Nice, simple kind of a shape, fit a cone, down pack. If you're Italian, spaghetti si digitaliano, all right? That's a rope of pasta. But no, that's a rope of gutta percha. You see other anatomy here. You see a little bit of anatomy coming at us or away from us. And look at the lesion in just six weeks. The bone is already filling in. Endodontics is regenerative. It is a regenerative procedure that invites bone fill. All right, and then finally, who cares what we did if it doesn't work? So I read all these papers and joy and excitement about a six-month recall. Oh, we did this in one year. How about looking at these cases, 15, 20, 30, 40? I'm to where I look at 40-year recalls. And so that keeps validating that what we're doing is working. Working. Like this case with the lateral root lesion. The leo's not apical, it's laterally. The sinus tract traces to the lesion. Careful access through a portion of fused to metal crown, down pack right into that anatomy, out with the two lateral canals. Oh, some of you are saying, that's pretty big, Cliff. That's a pretty big puff. Schilder taught us that surplus after filling is irrelevant to the prognosis of the case. Now, I'm not talking about packing the sinus in three dimensions. I'm not talking about putting a rope of gutta purchase through the bundle up to the ear. No, I'm talking about puffs around the roots. Okay, does it work? Well, there it is at one year. So we were like this. Now we're kind of like this. And now look at how tight that bone is. You know, you're loving these biocompatible sealers. This is not one that you would call biocompatible, but I only have about 50 years of cases to say it is biocompatible. The bone does grow back. It is accepted by the body. The immune system does not try to create resorptions and fancy things. It just does what it does best. Grows bone. Grows bone. So you can start see disinfection is really central to endodontic success. Very central. Like this by cuspid here. You can see the recurrent decay. We know mandibular bicuspids are tough. We know they often have multiple apical portals of exit. So we don't find them all with files. We allow our reagents to work in the uninstrumentable portions of the root canal space so we can three-dimensionally address the anatomy. So it's fun stuff. And this is probably why I'm still doing this. I'm in my 76th year. I'm having as much fun as I've ever had because the anatomy always brings you back for more, just like for you, just like for you. I don't know, is there seven or eight apical portals of exit? I mean, Frank Paquet showed some teeth that had an exit up in here and then a horse tail, a horse tail down there. But we can see that clinically similar, not the same cases, certainly. Uh, 
I want to show you a lot today in the time I have. Uh, long bridge abutments. This is a very important interior abutment. Long, edentulous space bridged. But two systems. I was aware of two systems, but I wasn't aware of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven portals of exit. John West and I have been playing a game for decades, but it's how many POEs do you get per shape canal? John's been about 2.9 portals of exit for every one shape canal. That should kind of give you an instance, uh, an indication, I should say, that, you know, are you, how you doing? Are you shaping one canal, getting one exit? Is that kind of your life? <laughs> well, when you look at these molars and my patient, Hyphek, I believe, my goodness, look at the anatomy. Ruddle nested, it came off of a orifice, just sub orifice below the bone, the bones up in here, okay? comes off, travels down for millimeters, joins another anastomosis, another portal of exit, multiple portals of exit. Molar anatomy is very complicated. We don't think it so much as clinicians sitting there, but your job is to treat the trunk of the tree and let the reagents work out of the limbs of the tree. And when you start to do that, good things happen. We cut our posts specifically to fit the canal. We don't use a drill and a post guided drill to make an optimal shape bigger. So chair side will just machine a post in and put it in. Forget the anatomy, forget the bifidity, furcal canals. This is endodontics. This is endodontics. Look at that distal root. Three systems in the distal root, three systems. And you know, one's pretty simple, another one's pretty simple, and then one's got a corkscrew at the end. Using the files appropriately, getting the shapes, Maintaining patency, deep shape comes to mind. All the things that Mosh 2 and West have talked about for decades. You're saying that's just too big. You can't put sealer like that, Ruddle. Oh, I know you think it's a bioceramic sealer, don't you? No, it's Kerr Pulp Canal sealer. It's the best sealer still in the world, but you've all moved on to something else because, well, I guess you think the sealers need to be biocompatible and they need to be osteogenic and they need, you know what needs to be osteogenic? Remove the contents of the root canal space. The body does what it does best. You don't have to leave stuff behind and with fear of leaving stuff behind. Try to use a sealer that has a half-life and starts absorbing as it releases. Oh, what do you want to release? Calcium sulfate? Do you want a phosphate? Uh, Hydroxyapatite? Is that what you're trying to release? Trying to stimulate that stuff? Just trust your endodontics. We laid a flap on this for teaching purposes. This is a media post-op. A media post-op. So I went through a crown. The crown flew off the tooth. So we put a band around it so I'd have a reservoir, reference points. Packed it off. Pulled the flap back. Cha-ching, took a picture and slide it over. Two years later, pulled the flap back, about 10-minute procedure, took a picture, watch how the bone grows into the furcation. Watch how the bone rises to the surface. Watch how the bone repairs. So when you see that, it gets you kind of excited. The puff is irrelevant. What's relevant is to remove the breakdown products to shape appropriately and to seal. That's what's important. The puff is irrelevant. So, and real quick, in closing on this section, I have made a living doing retreatment. Out of every 100 patients or 1,000 patients, I would see 90 to 1,000 of them, depending on which number you like, they'd already had endodontics. I was redoing somebody else's work. You can talk to the previous endodontist that did, got root in closure, got Herzwig's epithelial root sheet to stimulate. That's quite nice. Did a nice pack on a young tooth with a huge canal, but years later it's breaking down and it's not breaking down apically, it's breaking down laterally. So here's my flap up. You can see the window in the bone. You can see the granulomatous tissue, a little bit of curatage. And then I found a cemental tear. You can kind of see it in here, kind of see it if you look carefully. And there is the POE, Guadal's lucky. It's at me, it's facing me, it's not around the corner and on the Powell side. So we get it corked and you're gonna say, Ronald, why didn't she carry it all the way in until you saw pink gutta percha? Just didn't do it. Should have done it, could have done it. Maybe ifs and buts, candy nuts, we'd have a Merry Christmas. That's coming just in a little bit. So in any event, watch the bone work. 
Notice where I curated, you can see the little jog in the PDL, how it goes up, jogs in, makes a little jog like that. You can see that perfectly, but the bone is tight, everything is closed, and that's the importance of lateral canals. So I have heard for decades, even more back in the 80s and 90s, I never saw a case fail because of a lateral canal. I never saw a case fail uh, laterally, furcally because of endodontics. Well, maybe you just weren't looking. I don't know. I had a whole practice of it. So I'm showing you failures. That's a pretty good cork in the end of that canine. I'm sorry, that's a bicuspid. And incidentally, this is carrying a free distal partial denture bilaterally. This is a really important tooth. These are all splinted together, okay? So I just had a simple access. You can see an infrabony pocket. You can see a lateral root lesion. And you can see when we packed it, there it is. Out with the crestal lateral canal, out with the more apical lateral canal, and watch the bone work. Over the years, watch the bone rise to the surface. Perry Doss loved this. General Dennis loved this. I thought we were a specialist that was said, our mantra was, specialist in saving teeth. And we're still fight, fighting over should we fill a lateral canal. That still happens. It's now breaking down with all the technology. And as people get excited about lasers and acoustic streaming and all of these buzzwords, we're seeing hundreds of dentists move finally towards their full potential as they move towards the technology that they dismissed the anatomy earlier, but now the anatomy suddenly is important. I can do it too. So from a teacher standpoint, over many decades, that's really a thrill for me. And I guess the last case is an endodontist has done two apicoectomies. There's a big lesion in here. When he's in here doing his apicoectomies, he goes, I'll include the canine too. He puts a retrograde in, but within a few months, the retrograde fell out loss of retention. It's an empty canal. That's not endodontics. So what we need to do is just go in there and pack it to the consistent drawing point out with the lateral canal. Notice this sealer. About that much of it is right here. That blew right through the sinus track. And when we took the rubber dam off, there's Kerr Pulp Canal Sealer. That's most of Ruddle's puff. So pluck that out and slide it over and watch the bone get coming in now. Watch the bone coming in, and then a little bit later in time, more bones coming in. So we can do a lot with failures by just knowing how to move some instruments around, get a root-appropriate shape, lots of reagents, okay? And then, of course, using a cone, heating it up, pressing, and out with the anatomy. 2,000 pounds per square inch hydraulics. So a little montage of just some fun cases. We have uh, many of these montages. Just a quick glance, you can see there's a lot of anatomy in these teeth. Okay, so we've looked at quite a bit of anatomy in a relatively short period of time. Uh, that's kind of what got me hooked years ago is just seeing the great ones come in to the program and show anatomy. And of course, you wanted to model success and success does leaves clues. So now let's look at some methods and ideas and materials and ways we might actually clean a root canal system in an affordable and efficient way. All right. So I chose a mandibular bicuspid because they are known internationally, regardless of epidemiology and different ethnic groups and populations, to be wild teeth from an anatomical standpoint. They can hold a lot of different kinds of configurations, and I think we should look at them. The good news is we only have to treat the trunk of the tree, and if we use reagents with some thought and skill and knowledge of what we're trying to do, we have the opportunity to clean laterally. Not only can we use the instrumented portion of the canal to hold our reagents, but now we can activate it to move it into the uninstrumentable portions of the space, you know, the ones we're fascinated with. So how do we do that? And I could give a whole day lecture. In fact, when Elon asked me to give this presentation, uh, he wanted three topics and he chose this one, Ruddle didn't. I had one on microsurgery, I had one on non-surgical retreatment and one on 3D disinfection. I thought they were all hot buttons and I think he was right. This is probably the hottest of the buttons. But this would be quite a point to make we could spend a lot of time together. We could probably have some heated debates, but we'd all go down at the end of that discussion. I'd call it a discussion. It wasn't an argument. 
because I care what you're doing. I hope you care what I'm doing. I hope together we can get to where we're trying to go. And there are no experts on the road to excellence. There's just people fascinated with learning. So let's keep our minds open and see if we can learn something. So I could talk a lot about shaping. That's what I'm alluding to. You probably already knew it. But, you know, we've had a whole renaissance in shaping. Uh, people uh, on the AAE form bash the words, the look. And those words were invented by Herb Schilder. It's kind of funny. The people that are bashing the look call it legacy and anonics. They don't even understand what Schilder said. They don't understand what he wrote. They obviously never heard him speak, or if they did, they dismissed him. He never gave dimensions. He never gave a terminal diameter. He never gave an apical shape. He gave concepts, a cone-shaped preparation. Every cross-sectional diameter gets narrower and narrower as we move through the canal towards length. Number three, maintain the original anatomy. Canals move and flow in and out of the primary beam and, of course, anterior, posterior, and radiographs. Maintain the position of the frame and don't move it. Don't relocate it on the external root surface. We've talked about this over and over and over. That's part of the look. And keep the frame as small as practical. A lot of you are now getting that. Many of you that have jumped on minimally invasive endodontics not so many years ago, ha, not so many months ago, maybe, you were taking 30s, 35s, 40s to length. The textbooks are full of a 4006 is perfect. The favorite file in the world for 20 years was a 3006. That's bigger than anything I've ever taught. Children never even taught that. That's completely outrageous stuff. But misunderstandings, misconceptions, and perpetuated endodontic myths, they just keep piling on and we have generations of kids that kind of get it sorted out but not completely so the shape is absolutely appropriate it's not a dimension it's appropriate for the root that holds them most of my foramina on posterior teeth are about a 20 or a 25 most of my shapes are about seven or eight percent in the apical one third three four or five millimeters deep shape Deep shape serves to shorten the length of the lateral canals. Deep shape makes them more easy to clean. Deep shape holds a larger reservoir of reagents. Deep shapes can be activated with a bigger volume of irrigant, and you can have more efficacy, all right? And then, of course, clean root canal system give you the opportunity, if you're using a hydraulic, I didn't say a hydraulic sealer, I said a hydraulic mechanical technique, you can push material into this anatomy. So we could spend a whole day, I have spent a whole day, I've come to your country, I'm sure, and spent a whole day talking about cleaning and shaping. And then in Gothenburg about 20 years ago, I said, nope, let's call it shaping and cleaning, because clean and shaping was Schilder's words, and it came from a time where we spent blocks of time shaping and cleaning and irrigating and shaping a little bit more and progressively opening it up, and it happened over time. But with the advent of NITI and Rotary in the early 90s, the shape started to come pretty quick. And by the time we got to the 21st century, I mean, geez, we were making shapes and canals very quick. And so all of a sudden we were shaping, but we weren't clean. So the shape is what holds the arrogant. The, whole, the shape is what's going to dictate what you fill. Now, so you don't get too upset out there. If you're using some of the modern technology, you can emphasize smaller shapes. You heard it from Ronald, right? You heard it. You can have smaller shapes if you have something like a laser. The, the, we'll look at it shortly. Um, but you have to look ahead even further. How are you going to fill it? It's amazing to me how the world of endodontics worldwide has gone from very predictable ways of filling root canal systems to a single cone and a huge reliance on a sealer that has very little evidence. Yes, you have lots of six-month papers and one-year papers on sealer, but you love the bioceramic sealers. Why do you need an active sealer inside the root canal space? I thought you cleaned it. What are you going to be doing with a, in a, a, a bioactive sealer inside an avascular root canal system? These are things to think about, okay? So, it is a triad. There's even argument that there's no more triad. That's the legacy in the donics. But from what I can tell, from all of you out there, you're doing some kind of a shape, 1703, you love a 2004. Some of you are using, as you call it, legacy shaping files. And then you're using like a gentle wave. In fact, when I read the gentle wave research recently, and there's not much, <laughs> there's a scarce amount. There's lots of clinical papers and papers showing what somebody did, but there's very little quote, scientific evidence, 
But don't you know that some of our biggest names in the field were using Pro Taper? They were using a 2007. Are you with me? They were using a 2007 and they're using generally, they call it minimally invasive endodontics. I was very happy to have Pro Taper put in the family of minimally invasive. That was a thrill for me. So this is going to dictate your ability to fill root canal systems. You can't push material into blocked, occluded anatomy. The anatomy has to be cleaned out so there's available space. We all remember Newton's laws of physics. Only one space can occupy the same, one mass can occupy the same space at the same time. So if it's blocked, you're not filling it. So we could talk a lot about that. But when you pull a file out, let's, let's just go to the length of the file and we'll take it out. And let me remind you what you already know in the recesses of your mind. You know that there's going to be a lot of debris left behind. In Boston, they call it schmutz. All right. We know in the lateral canals, there's going to be tissue. We know there's going to be a sheet of dentine mud blocking and occluding the dental tubules. We know bacteria can go microns, many, many, three, four, five hundred microns, one millimeter back off the shape canal and hide in the dental tubules. We know about plactonic movement. We know about biofilms, cork communication. We know about all this stuff. But you have a smear layer. You have a dirty canal after you pull out the last file. That's why we say shaping and cleaning. Now you're ready to go. And our job is to remove all the tissue, not arbitrary amounts of tissue, not convenient amounts of tissue, but everything in the space. That's your job, okay? That's your job. There's always going to be a smear layer. It's a byproduct of instrumentation. So we know that that blocks the lateral canal so our reagents can't get in there to even do their job and clean. And then I talked a little bit about biofilms, but these are communities of bacteria. They secrete polysaccharides, sticky masses. That's the moat around the castle. Now when you're irrigating, your irrigant a lot of times doesn't even get to the microorganisms because it's blocked by the castle and that's the polysaccharides. So you got to use something that's active, something like a laser, gentle wave. You got to mechanically break these up so you can flush them out of the tooth and liberate them from the root canal space. Now, you know, the father of international dentistry, that's all countries, all people, was Pierre Fouchard, all right? And what did he say in his famous treatise? Flush, repeat after me, flush the toilet of the cavity. Well, then he come along many years later, and it's North America, and it's G.V. Black, the father of North American dentistry. What did he say in his famous book? Flush, repeat the word, flush the toilet of the cavity. Now, if you want to get more personal, get in that, get out of those disciplines and get into endodontics where we live. What did Childers say? Flush the root canal system. So an honorary flush for three guys. Oh, I love this. Oh, that last little bit is what prepared the canal for filling. All right. So a little fun along the way. You know, I try to have you laugh a little bit, have you think about stuff. Maybe you get inspired. Maybe you learn a little bit. How about all that? And that would happen in about 90 minutes. So when I was a kid at Harvard Foresight, we did research. My research was looking at the adaptation of warm gutta percha, sealer interface to dentin. And we fractured. Here's where we shaped. You can get a sense of it. The shape's in here. But then we split the teeth so we could look back down these dentinal tubules. We could look down these dentinal tubules and see how far we could irrigate. We could irrigate something close to seven or eight microns in the 70s, the way we were taught to do it. An appropriate shape, lots of irrigation, 30, 40 cc's per canal. That's easy to do. And then you expend your last syringe and you know it's time to pack. Okay, so... Some of you got that. I'm going to talk about some ideas. And the first thing I'm going to talk about are the reagents. And I'm just going to give it lip service. We use sodium hypochlorite. Check. We differ on the concentration. We differ on the volume. We differ on the temperature. Yeah, we differ on a lot of stuff. But we agree it's sodium hypochlorite. I use 6%. A lot of the research is 3%. Some of it's 1.5%. What are you, a philanthropist? Using 1.5%, you'll do the research the rest of your life? You hope the air gun will get in there and clean? Come on. All right. So use a, a, a concentration that has been shown to be safe and effective. 
But I want to show the dynamics. A lot of you don't realize how sodium hypochlorite gets in there or if it gets in there or is it luck? Is it a religious thing? Is it a lot of prayer? Uh, do you have to fall on your knees and beg for mercy? No, let's look at how it really works. And then we'll look at mechanical energy. There's two kinds, ultrasonics and sonics. We'll look at multisonics. Many of you out there are going, Cliff, talk about Jello Wave. I got to hear your thoughts on it. Well, we already got sued once from them. <laughs> but the lawsuit went away because it was ridiculous. I'm here to tell you the truth. If the truth hurts, sue me. All right. And then we'll talk about lasers. And if we get all that done, a round of applause for all of us because we made it through Ruddle. All right, here we go. Let's just look at one last thing. Before you tout your horn and tell everybody you're doing superior endodontics, before you tell people you get ultra fast healing, I can't even believe how fast my healing is, why don't we look at the evidence and let's, be, let's note right now with these techniques, there is up and down literature. It's not sealed, delivered, and it's in the jury's end. No, it's completely viable. It's fluid. It's flowing. We'll learn more as we go forward. Shouldn't it be easy to do? Shouldn't this evidence be collaborated? It should be collaborative around the world. Different schools, if they use the same protocol, should be able to get the same results. And finally, shouldn't it be readily affordable? You shouldn't have to mortgage the house. And if you are going to pay a lot of money, can we have a, something that's not a one-horse pony? It needs to be able to do multiple clinical procedures. Then we can justify the cost. I've written about these things and other things, and you can go to my website, but uh, there's a lot of downloadable articles there, video clips and different things you can look at. And uh, we have thousands and thousands of international dentists visit us daily. All right, let's look at dynamics. So I put a rubber dam on this quadrant, snap through with floss, no clamps, no blocking of visibility. You can see we have carries. And you can see, probably most of you can see something down here, but some of you are able to see this. It's just early breakdown. Of course, if you went in there with your cone beam, you would see a frank, overt radiolucency. So we're going to get this cleaned up, and we're going to use a material that I've talked about 25 years ago, Hypake. Hypake is the same specific gravity, sodium hypochlorite. It's water-soluble. Wherever sodium hypochlorite goes, water will go, so you can get it out, put it in. It's opaque. It's not as opaque as a Kerr Polk Canal Sealer Gutta Percha Pack, but it's going to be as opaque as calcium hydroxide. And you can see in about the first 20 minutes, I'm sorry, the first 10, 15 minutes, you can see where to here. This is in the old days when the shapes progressed over ch chair time. All right, let's get that out of there. So you can see we take another x-ray a little bit later and high peak can be seen moving and puddling on the PDL. Now this doesn't say it's clean, does it? Ladies and gentlemen, this says it'll move. This gives us a sense of the dynamics. So our irrigants move progressively. They move slowly and it takes a little time to eat, digest and move out tissue, and then it can move a little bit further. To the extent you have deep shape, you can shorten the lengths of these lateral canals and make them easier for your reagents to get into. So we still have to do histology. We have done histology. Clear section analysis, SEM, as examples. And then you can flush that stuff out, fit your cone down, pack out with the lateral canal. So dynamically, I have done several hundred roots I have shown this several times to the right groups around the world, showing it on all teeth, uppers and lowers, but high peak moves. It's a radiopaque transfer agent. It gives you a radiogram where you can see it on the film. Let's look at ultrasonics. So that's a little bit about sodium hypochlorite, 6%. I use 17% EDTA to remove the smear layer, and that's it. That's all I'm using. I'm not using a myriad of other ideas. Specifically, I'm not using CHX. There's no reason to use chlorhexidine when sodium hypochlorite kills everything on contact in 10 seconds. The key word I said was contact. All spores, viruses, and microorganisms zapped, dead, destroyed, 10 seconds contact. All right, let's look at ultrasonics. This is the most popular way up until I'd say the last uh, 10 years. 
Everybody thought ultrasonics was a cast meow, cavitation, acoustic streaming cleft. Oh, you won't believe it. But let's look at ultrasonics because I never used it because I already knew what was going on when I used my mouth there like you do. I saw a lot of dental mud coming up. But it has a frequency of about 35 to 40,000 cycles per second or, or hertz, if you prefer. So it's very, very fast. You get a sinusoidal wave that passes through the instrument. The peaks and valleys are very close together because it has a high frequency, so you guys love it. But what does this mean? When you think of cleaning, you should really just be thinking of this formula because cleaning actually is equivalent to streaming velocity. And it's related directly to the frequency. The frequency is related exponentially to the amplitude and it's divided by the radius of the instrument at D2 or 3. So that is exactly what different groups are doing. Some people are very infatuated with frequency. They love ultrasonics. Cliff Ronald likes amplitude. It's more promising. It's exponential. Plus, there's other advantages. And we can go to the literature and we can learn a lot more from our friends around the world. Um, Phil Lumley's a great guy in Birmingham. He's done a lot of great work over the years. And the problem with ultrasonics, by definition, you're using a metal insert tip. You can use a fluted file, like Serac, I'm sorry, Satellac makes a, a fluted file, eerie safe, okay? But you can also get non-active, just blank metals. The point I'm trying to make is, whether it's an active fluted file or a smooth blank file, it cuts dentin. One cuts faster, one cuts slower, but the very smear layer you're trying to remove, you're making it. You're creating it. Think about that. And of course, did I mention ultrasonic instruments can't go around curves and even in the straightaway portions of the canal with your small, skinny, minimally invasive concepts and philosophy, you're going to touch walls. And that means ledges. It could be perforations. Broken instruments are widely reported. And of course, you're making mud. So, the last comment I'd like to make is this is a pendulum and when it swings, it's going to swing out maximum and the angle's alpha. When the pendulum swings equal and opposite, that's called alpha. So two alpha is our pendular swing. And when ultrasonic instruments touch dental walls, it dampens two alpha. Two alpha is restricted and you lose the pendular motion. You lose the cavitation. You lose the acoustic streaming. If you don't believe me, just go to the mouth and put an ultrasonic tip that's moving against a, a wall inside the axis cavity, an axial wall. You'll see it just almost stops immediately. If you use a bigger, more aggressive tip, if it's coated and you keep pushing more lightly, you'll start cutting. Well, it's awfully quiet out there. I guess I'm getting a lot of thinking going. I can see there's a lot of people around the world that are going, wow, I'm learning some ideas here. There's some practicality in all this. Dampening, it's your worst fear besides broken instruments and iatrogenic events with ultrasonics. This is an optimally prepared canal and a specially prepared block. The Brunel hardness of the plastic is similar to dentin, so don't think it's we're comparing a soft plastic to dentin. It's about the same Brunel hardness number. The factory helped us make these at my fair. This is a, a 2007. It's, I think, exquisitely prepared. Multiplanar curvature, and there's a cone fit, and you're ready to pack. But what would you say clinically? Well, let me get the cone out of here, and I'll go through my ultrasonic cycle, and then we'll be good to go. Well, let's... And it's recommended generally three cycles, 30 seconds each. I'm going to just do this one time. So this is a file. It's a 1502, like Erie Safe. It's loaded up on an ultrasonic device with the connector. And you can see all the mud I'm making. Well, that's not disinfection. You can see how I'm changing the outline pattern of the optimal shape. I'm ripping the foramen and relocating it, which violates shoulders number four. Don't move the foramen on the external root surface. And now when you take the cone that used to fit perfectly to length, now the cone fits at least in this well two millimeters long, 
Maybe it's even three millimeters long to the gutta percha and you've ripped and destroyed the canal. That's ultrasonics and people are still saying, I use it, I use it, I use it. Can you use it around a curve? No. Some of you say, yeah, I pre-curve mine. Well, really? Are you Houdini? I didn't know you were that clever. All right. So what Bob Sharp and I came up with, Dr. Bob Sharp in Sacramento, California these days, a uh, longtime friend, great clinician, uh, many, many years ago, about 15 years ago, uh, we wanted to vibrate a polymer. And we wanted to use something that was non-metal, that was flexible, that wouldn't cut dented. It could go around a curve and it wouldn't dampen. Let's take a look. It has a huge amplitude. Geez, when ultrasonics fires, I mean, you can with your naked eye, uh, ultrasonics is about a tenth of a millimeter to alpha. This is more like five millimeters. And you're going, wait a minute, Ruddle. You can't stuff a five millimeter to alpha in a one millimeter orifice. It won't go. Yeah, you can. Turn it off, then stick it in and turn it on. It will be restricted by the walls, but it will slap those walls in it'll mechanically like a brush, a toothbrush. The bristles of the brush can collapse in and cl better clean the anatomical morphology, which is irregular. So very slow, very slow on the frequency, very, very big on the amplitude. Let's take a look. It's a polymer tip, won't cut, won't break. Non-cutting. Won't cut dentin, you'll look in your mouth mirror and you'll see pieces of tissue coming out and you'll see uh, debris that you've left behind, but you won't be cutting. It's safe and there's no dampening. Now let's take a look at that claim, no dampening. This is a lot of information, let's just focus right here. The blue is sonics, I've superimposed the blue graph of sonics over ultrasonics and they're proportionally correct. One is slow, sonics, so ice has a huge amplitude. So if you look over here, we talked about alpha and two alpha. You can kind of see the silhouette of the tip here. It's kind of blurry, but you can see as I'm superimposed over the block, I have a lot of action at the tip. At the bottom, I'm trying to show you this is like this, and this is about like this. That's about a 60 degree angle. And you can see the tip here is still moving apical to the constriction. So around curves, you can write on the wall, the tip is still moving and you get two alpha. So this has been discussed. Uh, we've I've said it again, I'm gonna beat it to death. Ultrasonics, you lose two alpha, you break tips, you have iatrogenics and blah, blah, blah. This is now, you know, five years ago, we had almost 100,000 customers internationally. It's really taken off since Densply Serona now carries the endoactivator. If you go in the mouth and take a quick look, I want to talk about Vortex. I want to talk about Crown Down. These are things you probably don't know because I'm now just trying to teach you a little bit. Start the chrono one third. One third. Stay there. Agitate about five seconds. Now go to the middle one third. Agitate about five seconds. Now drop on down two millimeters short of length and go ahead and what? Finish your cycle, the protocol cycle, which I'll talk about. Now, if you do that, you're going to get a vortex on a micro scale that is very similar to a mic macro scale tornado, just scaled down and happening in a little tiny space. So lots of research has been done. I want to, this is Caron's research from Paris 7 under Mosh 2. The two of them and their team did the endoactivator. This is the first study in the world that looked at curved roots on mandibular molars. Most disinfection studies, sadly, because they were done with ultrasonics, they had to be restricted to anterior teeth, single rooted teeth, big canals, where you wouldn't touch dentin. Mosh 2's group went into another area. They wanted curvature, and they wanted to check clean around curves. So you can see quite a bit of curvature here. Look at these lateral canals. You can look into them. You can look down. The tubules are cleaned out to five, six, seven, eight hundred 800 microns. We can work bifidities all with a 2508 pro taper. That was the shape. It's not 8% over the active portion. That's what scares all of you and you don't understand. 8% is just the apical three millimeters and behind the fixed taper of 8%, it's seven, six, five. Hey, I'll say it another way. The back end of an F2 2508 is about one millimeter. At D9, it's 80. At D10, 
uh, at D9, it's 80, and at D12, it's about 90. So when I hear all oh, the big shapes, the legacy shapes, the Shilmarian shapes, you don't know what you're talking about. And I say that with total respect. I'd love to sit down and visit with you. All right. And the research started coming in. There's 50 papers on the Indo Activator worldwide. There's some up and down. And the ones that are down that aren't, nobody said it was bad. They just said it didn't work. It wasn't very effective. Uh, I was laughing. Sorry. You know what? A lot of them uh, cut off the clinical crown. There was no pulp chamber. The Indo Activator needs a pulp chamber full of what? A reagent. When you have a little orifice and you stick a tip into an orifice, you're displacing the reagent. So, of course, you're going to get uh, results that aren't like the protocols from other universities. So, lots of research, uh, only a few papers up and down, the vast majority. Some of these have been compared to lasers, uh, different ideas. Here's the MOSH-2 Corona study. Cantor, she checked out ultrasonics versus sonics head-to-head. -head. And a marvelous paper that was published in a peer-reviewed journal showed sonics was far superior. Why aren't you reading those papers? Are they not in the JOE? Is that the problem? They're in the old triple O. Is that what the problem was? Many famous people on this list, many people you recognize, many people. Look at these guys. Lots of guys. This is a great guy, him and Baruti. Okay, I could go on and on. I got to keep going. I have good news and better news. The good news is I just showed you an item that used to cost about $550 and the tips were two US dollars and for less than two dollars you could do disinfection chair side. So now I have even better news. Um, after probably close to a decade, a little longer actually, Dr. Sharp and I, of course, we had quite a few ideas that we had gathered over this time frame and we want to integrate into something that would be more efficacious, that would be um, more complete. We want to change some things, and I want to share that with you now. And this whole kit right here is about $2,500. That's if you buy everything. But if you don't buy this, and if you don't buy this, and you just buy 3D disinfection, I'm thinking it's approximately $1,900. Now, let's explain what we're talking about. Let's explain what we're talking about. This is the Smart Light Pro Indo Activator. This has replaced the Indo Activator. Uh, Son Indo will want me to tell you, and I would tell you anyway, but I'm commercially involved in the Indo Activator with Dr. Shark. We're the inventors. We held the patents. It was our original idea. Uh, we went through regulatory. My daughter hauled us all the way to the market and then got us licensed in many countries around the world. Finally, we did sell it to Yes, by Serona, and this is now, after about two years of work, this is what we came up with. And what you can see is we have a really sleek hand piece. Uh, there's your on-off button. That disposable battery, that's an iron phosphate battery. It's the highest technology in battery. It just snaps in. You have a rotatable swivel head, so you can get to all quadrants at all times. So it's very ergonomic. Uh, what's new? You want to know, well, why would I invest in this over the other one? Well, the other one, I don't think you can still get it. You might if there's stock in some countries, but more or less, Display Serona has moved forward, and they're using the Smart Light Pro base. It's a workflow thing. And I didn't mention, and I should mention this in fairness, those other things that I eliminated, one was a curing light. It's been rated as one of the best in the world. It has the deepest curing range of all curing lights. The next little attachment piece, if I were to go back, was a translimator. It was a way to use fiber optic lights to look for fractures and things like that. So that caddy gave you workflow for restorative dentistry, which you're doing every single day. You're diagnosing and looking at teeth before you restore them to see if there's cracks and things like that. And then, of course, you're disinfecting root canals. So it's had multiple ideas inside the caddy. What's new is we the old system operated at 10,000 cycles per minute. So we have almost increased by 100% the frequency. Now, if you remember the formula, 
the pronosticates our cleaning ability. One of them is frequency. So that's that. The other thing we looked at is we made a sleeker unit. If you hold this one compared to the other one, which I thought was very good, it was cordless too. This is cordless, but it's more ergonomic. It's sleeker. It's got the rotatable swivel head. And I think if you just picked it up, you would know what I said. The tip designs have changed, okay? If you look at the cross section, the tip design is a parallelogram. It's like a paddle. And if we were trying to paddle in a boat through water, if you had a cylindrical tube, if you had a paddle that has surface area, the paddle is going to create more displacement of water and forward thrust, better wave propagation. So we changed the tip and we also changed its motion. The old device goes linear motion. That's back and forth, back and forth. This is making an irregular figure shaped eight. It's taken from hygiene. The magnetostrictive idea that's used constantly by hygienists. They want an irregular movement because they want to get into the irregular surfaces of teeth and around roots and furcation areas so they can clean better. Well, that's what we're doing inside. So we wanted to change from linear motion to uh, elliptical motion. The decibels is down by 50%. We got this thing 50% quieter. It now purrs very softly like a little cat. So that's what's new. And if you think about the protocol, I didn't give it to you up above for the old ones, the same protocol. You're going to shape the whole canal, however your shaping concept is in the presence of sodium hypochlorite, preferably about 6%. You're going to select the tip, and the tip is going to go within 2 millimeters of your working length. Did you hear that? 2 millimeters. Another requirement, that's the A. That was A. So select the tip. So A is, oh, we got to have something that you can see, don't we? two millimeters short and it needs to be loose loose why because the tip should not be bound its tip should be free so you can get your two alpha take a syringe aspirate out all of your sodium hypochlorite that was in there i didn't say dry the canal with paper points just aspirate and then top the tooth off with 17% ETA, and you're running at one minute per canal. That's one minute per canal. Aspirate that out. Load it with sodium hypochlorite. Um, 30 seconds. It's a minute and a half. It's 90 seconds per canal. That's the endoactivator. That's the protocol. That was not a protocol that Bob Sharp or Cliff Rodel were able to do. We use some of the top names in industry from the European uh, theater. Gulab Aval at the Eastman, Lumley at Birmingham. Uh, I guess we had George Surtees at Zurich, Pierre Marsh II at Paris 7, and we had Paul Lambrecht's group at the Catholic University of Leuven. Some of these, not those guys, Gulab Aval is lecturing in this Congress, but some of those universities are represented by other clinicians speaking in this forum. How about that? So that was the research that came out. That was done by them, and it took about three years to figure out what the protocol was going to be. If you follow that protocol, you'll get similar results. If you push once, you're going to be able to work at about 18,000, and that's going to be 3D disinfection. There's adjunctive procedures. If you double-click quickly, You will go to 3,000. That's way lower than the old endoactivator. And those adjunctive procedures are vibrating MTA into root defects, placing and removing calcium hydroxide, agitating solvents like xylol in the retreatment of gutta percha and removal process. So we can use this for other things. It's not just a one horse 3D disinfection pony. It can be bagged and let's deploy it. Here we go. So with a pulp chamber full of EDTA, you can see now the parallelogram-shaped cross-section. You can see the motion isn't back and forth. It's irregular. It's elliptical. You can see where we are in the tooth. So we're going to work for a few seconds here, right? We said that. And I think we can go maybe a little different color. We can do another five seconds and do the middle one-third. And then you can do the rest of your protocol 
in the apical third. Now notice, if you watch this tip move in slow motion, it fractures a liquid. At the liquid interface fracture, bubbles are formed. These bubbles are unstable because of heat and pressure. As they expand, they implode. When they implode, they send out a jet. Boom! And that's like a power hose cleaning paint off of a masonry wall. So you get a lot of implosions, you get a lot of shear forces, and that's how you break colonies and matrices of bacteria free. So if you look at this loop, it's sped up a little bit. As we clear the loop, you can see how it's progressive, how the agitation is moving the irrigant. Fresh irrigant is replaced uh, if necessary. The chamber is brimful at all times. I really love this animation. I want to acknowledge our animator who passed away. Uh, he did some wonderful things showing shock waves and lifting massive bacteria off of dentinal surfaces and opening up tubules so we can marry our gutta percha sealer into this complex. All right. And then we go into the apical third and finish the protocol. So if you're doing a minute protocol, about five upstairs crawl, about five in the middle, and then about 50 seconds to clean it out in the apical one third. And you can see it's progressive as the lateral canals are cleaned out. So you're gonna have a lot of debris and the debris is gonna be inside you. It's gonna definitely be inside the canals. So we gotta have an idea. I want you to use a handheld syringe. They're about a dollar, whatever they are in your country. I want the syringe to be cut, the cannula cut 90 degrees to the cannula, no side port, that doesn't work. And what we're gonna do is show you something I learned years ago. I taught it to over a thousand people that came to Santa Barbara to train. And if you hold your syringe like this, you're pushing on the flange. You're pushing on the flange. If you push on the flange, you're going to push and pull liquids. When you push, when you push, you're sucking out, you're aspirating. So I'm using a 27 gauge needle. I'm not blocking it because I'm doing this at the end. Whatever debris there is, it's a finite amount of debris. It's small particulate matter, and you can pull it up into the syringe. Don't be doing irrigate aspirate early in the shaping game. You'll block your cannula. Now, it's been said in the literature that we can't irrigate any deeper than about two millimeters apical to our cannula. I just showed you six to eight millimeters of bouncing solutions Moving those solutions over surfaces, getting more agitation cleaning, and then aspirating that debris out. So that little trick is done every day, and I didn't have to uh, buy uh, a $1,000 piece of equipment to do this. I can do it with my $1 syringe. Okay. So we had a lot of research with the endoactivator. I told you 50-some papers. I showed you quite a few, maybe 10. Um, there's some good news going on here. This is just one slide, but Pileggi, Roberta Pileggi at the University of Gainesville in Florida, she uh, used the Smart Light Pro Endo Activator. The canals were shaped like with a 2508. That was the protocol. I would also accept a 2507. That would be fine for me, either an F1 or an F2. But she showed tubular exchange. She showed how the dye she chose to use, how it went out in the tubules, and you can see this big fanned out glow coming off the main canal. You can see a lateral canal. So that was pretty interesting. But as you're going to see in just a second, if you go to India, there's a big institution, very famous, SIDS, Cybar Institute of Dental Sciences. And we have a guy named Nagesh Bola, professor and he's doing a study on some things that are very exciting that we'll look at shortly, but he's looking at the new endoactivator as an example and showing fabulous results, more than what we could get with the endoactivator, the original. So we'll get that cleared up and we'll move on. We've written papers about it. This is probably the most recent uh, thing I've written. Um, I have written about this in 2008 and many times in between just to keep bringing the base of knowledge up, but this would probably capture the most recent words I have to say about the topic, so you can read all about it. It's referenced and peer-reviewed. It's downloadable. It's on my website. It's for free. 
All right, what else do we have? Gentle wave. Many of you have caught on to the gentle wave. I don't think you could have missed it. I think if you died, you missed it. But if you were resurrected, you were around when all this fever pitch commercialism came to market. Now, I want to say something and look right in your faces. I have a lot of gentle wave friends that use it, and they're very pleased with it. I am not here to offend anybody. Whatever it takes for you to treat a root canal system is what I'm all for. I don't care what you do it with. If you want to do it with some bizarre method and it's safe, let's have you do it. Maybe even talk about it. But I guess where I have been a little cynical about Gentle Wave is we've been able to treat root canal systems uh, for as long as mankind. And my Ruddle show, uh, many of you need to watch the Ruddle show. I think you'd really love it. It's on. It's a weekly show. It goes to about 100,000 dentists internationally. And we talked about a paper from 1948 by George Sharp. And he was doing a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about in 1948. But he did the work in the early 1900s. He published it in 1948. So let's all learn together and come along. So my point on Gentle Wave is, is it necessary? Is it necessary? That's my comment. I'm not saying it is or it isn't. I'm asking a question. You have the unit. The unit has now gone to about $100,000. I've heard it's maybe $85,000, but it's in the range of hundred k. You can do some incredible work. I want to acknowledge this guy, Reed Poland. Reed Poland is a fabulous clinician. Double the lines for you, Reed. Okay. Uh, Reed uses Pro Taper. These are Pro Taper shapes. So when you read all the stuff and listen to their gurus talk, you know, they're, oh, I don't even have to instrument anymore. Uh, I couldn't even, well, one guy said I could just take a file to the convenience point. And Gentle Wave will do the rest. Another person said, I can't get the link a lot. It's, it's a problem. Now I can get the link all the time, except when I can't, because we have papers on that. They're emerging all over the world. They're emerging about can, what can it do, what can it not do. But anyway, Reed Poland used a 2007 Pro Taper F1 finisher, got great shapes, and look at the power of Gentle Wave. This case right here, I've never seen one worldwide in the last 10 years that exceeds this for quality. And yes, Ali Naze, the look. The look. Things that are right have the look. Things that don't look right usually aren't right and they don't work and we see failures. So don't badmouth the look when you're looking at something that looks like Leonardo da Vinci did it. So beautiful curving flowing shapes, lots of anatomy. Do we have any downsides? You know, you got to build the platform. You got to attach the handpiece to the tube so you have a closed system. How does all that work? Well, I've taken out some of the more inflammatory things that I said that Gentle Wave didn't like. Uh, they didn't like the bleeding thing I mentioned, and they didn't like the post op pain. And a lot of you figured it out in your past that. But a lot of people haven't figured it out, and a lot of people do report it, and they have talked to me, and I have a binder very thick full of comments. So, you have the initial eighty-five to hundred thousand dollar investment, and then the long-term cost would be more attuned to uh, service fees, which can run many thousands of dollars a year. You don't want to break, do you? And if you do break, you want service. You got to put this platform on. That platform, I heard somebody say recently, he's got it down to thirty seconds. But I've just talked to tens and tens and tens of gentle wave users and they're saying platform time is often between five and 15 minutes based on the coronal tooth structures it broken off how do we build up walls and all that stuff so you have platform time and now you get started and you have disinfection time which is all over the place but let's just write eight minutes it's not all over the place maybe by the company saw an endo, but if you listen to their users, five minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes, two cycles, one cycle, platform broke, I had to start all over again, okay? It's created in my mind, needless complications to non-existent problems. We're now seeing shaping schemes slide around and shift to accommodate the technology. Remember Endovac? You had to instrument at least to a 30 to get the cannula down. Now you're making endodontics fit the technology. The technology is supposed to fit the endodontics, all right? So some are now working short because they don't want extrusions. They don't want uh, pain. 
And then, of course, everybody that uses it is pretty much, uh, not everybody, but many are going to a smaller shape, and that smaller shape now precludes the ability to use other kinds of ideas. Like, you, I'm not going to recommend the Smart Light Pro in a 1703. It's not going to have enough 2 alpha. Let's be serious. So there's room for gentle wave if you're going to do a minimal shape. But now, what are you going to fill it with? Well, almost everybody that's going minimal in nice has gone to a single cone technique. Come on, you guys. You're showing me lateral canals. Can you imagine what you'd get as clean as they are if you use some real hydraulics and not just the name implied? Uh, we had Josette Camilleri talk about this. She's brilliant. She knows a lot about these BC sealers, and she's talked about it on the Ronald Show. We have their iconic papers. Most of them are done by people that are on their board of advisors, so this isn't called free research. The papers are up and down. A lot of the papers aren't even scientific. We also have papers that say debris left behind. On the AAE discussion forum, Gary Carr took some extracted teeth that failed, split the roots, and showed how dirty some of these canals were in the apical third. So before we run the flag up and say we've found nirvana, Let's just stay open and see, well, is it true? I always ask about everything I'm talking about. I always ask, is it true? So that's kind of what I would say about Gentle Wave. It can clean root canal systems. Let's move on. Now, the one I'm most intrigued about if we're moving into a new future, and that would be lasers and endodontics. And we have more than one kind of laser. Your erbium, chromium, yttrium, strontium, gallium, garnet, they work at 2780 nanometers on the electromagnetic spectrum of light. Okay, so there's the invisible lights and then there's a part that humans can see. This is mid-infrared, mid-infrared, can't see it. So it's 2780. By definition, as you'll see soon, you must use wands that are 300, 400 microns. In other words, two tenths, three tenths of a millimeter to put it back in Indo language. And they must go in. And most, most textbooks from a variety of authors say you should start at about one millimeter short and then withdraw the instrument and withdraw the instrument. And the withdrawal rate is about one millimeter per second. So you're never stationary. You're moving. And notice the tip is sawed off at 90 degrees. That means their radiation your light energy is coming out pretty much with frontal pressure. So the literature, the DFUs, the directions for use, pretty much say, one, if I want to exaggerate, make this even a little better for you, maybe you'll have less problems. Uh, we, could say, uh, we could say one to two millimeters, and maybe that'd make you happy. Uh, on the website for some of these companies, they say two millimeters. I'm showing it so you'll know about three to five millimeters back. Every third, coronal one-third, middle one-third, apical third, is a little event of three, four, or five millimeters. So I'm saying stay back about the junction of the middle and the apical third. Move the instrument out. It fires. It has frontal pressure. If you hesitate, you can see in this book dentinal burns. You can see melted dentin, and you can even see some fractures and even some perforations, Okay. Those are bad things. They're not happening to Gil. <laughs> What's a Hebert? Hey, Hebert, I'm giving you a shout out in Oregon. You're fabulous. Uh, he doesn't know it yet, but he'll be on the Ruddle Show in the future. But he is showing cases on the form. He is the form's best clinician. Okay, hands down. He's their best clinician. And he's doing minimally invasive shapes. Very nice. But he's cleaning, and he's cleaning with... Uh, Chuck Goodis's Edge Pro Laser, okay? And this is kind of the protocol. Now let's compare that with this one. With this laser, I want to give a special shout out to this guy, Enrico DeVito. This was his patents. This was his IP. He stripped off the polyamide sheath. Now he encouraged lateral firing, radial firing, and he made a special tip. And the tip is basically tapered, and that disperses the beam out more. In this technique, you're in the pulp chamber only. That means you do all systems at once. It's very fast. It's very safe. You're a long ways away from length, aren't you? But 
this is kind of the two lasers in dentistry. This is 2940. And you're going, what's the big deal? It's the same. It's the same. Is it the same? It turns out that these lasers are selected because there's lots of lasers we've talked about on the Ruttle Show. I mean, one laser that works at seven, eight, and 900 is very good for wrinkles, okay? Uh, blemishes, you can, it's okay. Lasers have different principles and uses. This is absorbed by the water molecule, the best of all lasers in the world. If you want to break and burst a water molecule, you need to operate on the electromagnetic spectrum of light at in this range. But it turns out that this one requires 55% less energy. There's less energy because it makes a big difference. It's not a linear scale, it's logarithmic. So this is firing, and I'll show you how this works. So lasers, I'm all in. Lasers can do things in surgery. They can do phrenectomies. They can do gingival plasties. They're not a one horse pony. So I like their future. And there's many things that we're going to learn to use them for, even in regenerative work that people aren't even talking about yet. So I wrote the preface with Arnaldo Castellucci. So a little shout out to you, Arnaldo, my longtime pal. And we both wrote the preface for this book. And I've read the book two or three times. And it's amazing when I read the AA form, people are just spouting off about lasers. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know how the physics works and the light and all that stuff. So let's just get up to speed together. It's okay. We don't have to know everything. I want to pretty much end my lecture showing lasers in use. And I want to set up my dear friend, Marco Martignoni. He's like my son. Uh, his dad was the Pope's dentist in Italy years ago. He went to BU to run the prosthetic program at Boston University. He was the first microscope user back in the probably, I don't know if he's the first in the world, but he was using a microscope in the 60s. That predates endodontics by about 20, 30 years. So the other guy I want to acknowledge is Augusto Malantaca from Roma, from Rome. He wrote in the Italian Journal of Endodontics a very precise technique that he showed me in his office years before it was published in the journal. And it was a, about a week's process to take a tooth and prepare it for endodontic work. And so this is a lot of work to get here. I want to acknowledge that guy again. It's a lot of work to get to a shaved tooth, a cross section that's on the bench. It's open. There's no positive pressure. There's no positive pressure. We're on the bench. Remember in the mouth, we'd have a PDL, a periodontal ligament, and we'd have positive pressure around the root relative to the access cavity, which would be negative pressure. So I want you to watch this, and this is what Markle did, and here we go. He catheterized the canals because we all know from the literature, a flow channel, a flow channel it's like a rising tide that raises all disinfection ideas. For general wave people that say you don't have to catheterize anymore, really? Dream on. That's a convenient thing for saying I, I need to train up a little bit. I need to learn how to better negotiate and follow the original anatomy. So he catheterized these canals and they are apically patent. So it's just a small flow channel. It's minimally invasive. Let's take a look. There's a lot of anatomy that you might start to see. Uh, there's, you think there's two canals. There's a file here and a file here, but there's another whole branch up in here. Let's take a look. But I want to, I did a little animation uh, many years ago and I put it just in front, Marco. So forgive me, I didn't want to offend you, but my animation's in front just so you can see the dynamics of the steam bubble. Let's get going. So you put it in the chamber, stationary. It's not moving around. When this thing fires off, you get to 100 degrees centigrade temperature immediately. That's a steam bubble. As that bubble expands, it's going to be unstable. And when it implodes, it sends out 30 to 40,000 shock waves. This is like, the shock waves, just so you know this, the shock waves are traveling in meters per second. Think of a little tiny, it's 25 down here and it tapers up to about 1, 1, 1 1.1 1 at the orifice. And you're getting speeds like that. Notice all the places he did in the instrument, how he's breaking it up. Notice that little fine loop was finally cleaned out. Microns in its cross-sectional diameter and the irrigant flowed right in there and cleaned it out. 
I put this reference in here to bring attention. As you were watching this, you probably saw bubbles. And they talked about the milli, uh, okay, it's, it's millimeters of mercury pressure in the systemic vasculature relative to the two. The point is, because there's positive pressure around the root, that doesn't happen. They then went and took, these guys then went in vivo and did patients of record using a high peak radio contrast solution, and there were no post-operative problems, and there were there was no irrigant demonstrated to get beyond the confines of the root canal space. So you can see there's quite a bit going on. The research has come in. This is just a a glimpse. There's so many more papers since I put these in here showing the power of lasers. Lasers are about $100,000. Uh, good as the over there at um, Edge Endo or Edge Pro. Uh, I think uh, Edge Pro is the device. Edge Endo is the company. Uh, I think theirs is about, say, 50000 So a very affordable way. And what was really sad about this technique, and now Photana makes the light walker, that's the laser 2940, to do it. Because Rico DeVito's work, when he uh, joined up with Son Endo, he sold them the patents, and they have deep-sixed that project. And so I called the owner, and I said I was really interested in that laser, and he said it's not going to see the light of day. So that's too bad, but that's a little example of the right laser for the right job. So when you get to this point, I want to set up the future. I want to set up what it might look like. The future is going to be whatever we can all imagine. We all have a future, and we all see different futures. And some of us can look even further out and begin to imagine, based on what we know about the field and our work in different disciplines within the field, where it might actually be headed. And where you're headed is where you're going. So in the future, we're going to be able to scan these teeth. A lot of these reagents in the canal, um, like luciferase, it can work with a biomarker and it releases light. The light can be picked up and scanned. And you can get to a point where we can scan these in the future. We're going to know exactly, chair side, are we cleaned? I hope I'm cleaned. I pray I'm cleaned. I think I'm cleaned. I wonder if I'm clean. Well, now you're going to have a chair side. So I think the future is now. I'm going to set this up. Dr. Randy Cross was a student at USC post-grad program with Elon Rothstein. I met him many times when he was a resident because he came to Santa Barbara. We were doing the Ruddle with the residents programs for the post-grad students of Southern California. And Randy was one of those students. And we became friends and we started talking. And because of his background in biochemistry, he started telling me about a validation method he was thinking about that could actually measure, is the root canal clean? So I was so excited about his work. It took him time and he had to go from an idea to a product and all the chemistry and validation, regulatory, money. Oh, it's incredible, the journey. And I want you to see what Randy said. So I had him on the Ruddle Show the RuddleShow.com is free. There's no signups. About 100,000 people each show watch it. And I had Randy on, I don't know, a couple years ago. So now you'll see from Randy's idea all the way out chair side to its use. Let's take a look and we'll finish our show. Hey, Dr. Ruddle. Um, hope all is well. Thanks for having me on again. Since the last on the show, we've had a couple research projects with the Sabar Institute Dental Sciences. They had a 1,000 patient uh, study. Uh, Dr. Nagash was able to show that most canals go from dirty to clean as you increase the file size um, and do final activation of rinse like with the endo activator. But there's a lot of variability in that. Some of those teeth are still really dirty um, and some of them are clean. And that goes along with my clinical results as well. Like you just don't know unless you actually test for it, um, which hopefully goes to explain why some of these root canals are perfect on x-ray, but they still fail. And the reason for that is they're still dirty. They weren't activated enough. I want to set this up. So Randy was really excited because he's been working on this for several years. He now has a working model. Many dentists in the country are using it as a prototype. Some are institutions and some have gone out in the field to key opinion leaders like Brett Gilbert at Keen Endodontics. All right. So Brett is using a working version that's available. It's not for sale yet. That'll be next year. But this is out there. And I got mine. John West got his. 
clinicians are out. Let's listen and see what Brett Gilbert says. He will show you the simplicity of a chair-side method to validate 3D disinfection. Let's take a look. So the concept is, is that I've completed my instrumentation, all my irrigation protocol, and now I can actually get an indication of how clean the canals are. So the process is really pretty simple. So this device just sits chair side. Um, it has a little opener, so I'm gonna use this test tube and I'll be able to cultivate and take a sample. Now what it's actually looking for is adenosine triphosphate, which is available in any biological tissue. So whether there's blood, bacteria, tissue, any of that will be detected by it. So it's a very simple procedure. So basically I'm just gonna go ahead and um, I'm gonna flush with a little bit of water here. Okay. So again, my protocol is complete. I'm just gonna kind of flood the, the chamber with some water. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna uh, aspirate a little bit of the water back in. So this is coming right in from the chamber in the canals, just like so. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this tube out like so and all I need is a few drops just to go inside the test tube here so you can see there's just a couple of drops and then I use the swab to drag that down and take it together just a little flick like so and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it into the endocator and it has just very easy to bring it in and then press start now this is gonna work on a scale that's gonna indicate what type of biological material is actually in there. It takes about 10 seconds. So this is a chair side evidence. This is definitive evidence of how clean you've gotten the canal. So you can see that's a two, that's really great. So this is called the endocator again, biomarkers and endodontics. This is not like the old, old days when we were culturing bacteria. This is actually a biomarker to determine if there's any biological tissue. Now, if that reading was high, say above 50, then I would absolutely go back and do another irrigation protocol, reevaluate why I have biological material still in there. But with a reading of two, I feel very confident at this point that I can move forward and fill this case. So when you think about the implications of this as chair side evidence, definitive evidence that the protocols we're putting forward are doing the right work, doing the job thoroughly and effectively, I think this could be really amazing. So I just wanted to share this with you. All right. That was very exciting for me because across almost uh, five decades, the game has always been get it all out and 3D disinfection. And finally, we have a chair side method that you saw that uses ATP, a biomarker. And when it's mixed with luciferase, the enzyme, the illuminator is measuring light. So you have a measurable way chair side to know if you're clean. I wish you good luck in the future. And I think the old group back in the 80s, Tim Buck 3 said, the future is so bright, we got to wear shades. Okay, well, that was an inspiring presentation. And if you're looking for more 3D disinfection, um, you just recently shot that whole lecture continuum. And so we're going to be releasing over the coming months more footage from that that will be on 3D disinfection. And then we've also shot a lot of segments on 3D disinfection. So feel free to search it on yep. the Battle Show website and a lot of stuff will come up. So um, I also want to add, just as a reminder, that we will be doing a Q&A this coming season on the questions that the symposium attendees asked. So do you have anything that you want to add before we close out? I'm smiling because the questions from any audience everywhere in the world are always the same four questions, but they can follow that to see what those questions are because maybe they're not your questions. Yeah, I want to thank Elon. Uh, Elon, Professor Elon Rothstein, you're a great guy and all of your vast contributions to the field chairman at USC. And he's been doing this symposium for a long time. And if you look at those seven books all lined up, the seven Engel textbooks, Elon co-authored with Engel on that seventh edition. So that's pretty cool. I want to acknowledge all the other speakers. There were some really good speakers there and I learned some stuff. So I think all of you are going to be excited about these USC Engel symposiums. So thank you, Elon. Okay. So hopefully you got a, a little a taste of the Ruddle Show material with this special um, report. And we are very excited to be seeing you very soon in season 11.